world. Borealis. Paradigm. Expansion. Greetings from the North and welcome to the forum today called Hitler's Rat Line and the Nazi Cult in Diaspora. Our guest tonight is historian Peter Levenda. He is a genuine investigative author and one of the world's leading experts on the Nazi phenomenon. In the course of his more than 25 years of field research, Levenda has journeyed to more than 40 countries, gaining access to temples, prisons, military installations and government documents, interviewed historic persons, obtaining primary sources and making new discoveries. Levenda has appeared in many documentaries, especially on Nazism and the Third Reich. For his biography and complete bibliography, visit our website, where you'll also find links to all of his. Last time we had Peter on, we explored the ties between Nazism and the occult, up to the end of the Second World War. Now we will explore further what happened with the cult leader Hitler in the aftermath of the collapse of the Third Reich. This conversation is based upon Peter's three books on the subject. Welcome back to the forum, Peter. Thank you very much. Happy to be here. Very happy to have you back. We've looked forward to interview you on this topic, which is uh, what I call the greatest, the, the biggest news story in the post-war era, which is the survival of Hitler. Now, many people, when they hear this, uh, th- associated to, to crazy conspiracy theories like Elvis sightings and stuff sure. like that. But uh, I think that what we should uh, do today is to make them understand that this is serious facts. And in fact, if you if you could begin by tell us very shortly the mainstream arguments, reasoning for uh, the, what we've learned in school you know, that Certainly. Hitler died in the bunker. Certainly. Well, the the very end of uh, World War II in Europe, of course, was uh, the defeat of Nazi Germany in May of 1945. Word had already gone out by the by May 2nd or May 3rd that Hitler had committed suicide and died in the bunker, uh, the Berlin bunker at the Reichschancellery on April 30th, 1945. And this is the story that I grew up with and I never questioned it. And when people talked about, you know, Hitler having escaped, it was exactly as you say. It was like an Elvis sighting. (laughs) Uh, National Lampoon, the famous uh, satirical magazines uh, a few decades ago, uh, had their famous escape issue. And the cover of that issue, which I still have, is Hitler uh, sitting in a bamboo chair holding a drink with an umbrella in it. You know, uh, so this was this was the kind of idea that was around. And we all laughed at this concept. Mm. But the mainstream story, uh, as we were given it, as I grew up with it, Hitler died in the bunker. He killed himself. Uh, Eva Brown, he had just married his longtime uh, girlfriend or mistress, whatever you want to call it, Eva Brown. Um, and she died as well. Uh, the Goebbels family, the entire family of, uh, of Goebbels died uh through uh, uh, murder and suicide, including their dog. Mm. Um, everyone was, was killed. Gasoline was poured on the bodies. The bodies were cremated. Uh, end of story. The, the Soviets came in. They found the bodies. They confirmed this story. That's the mainstream story. And as I learned much, much later on in my life, um, after he- decades of having believed the Hitler uh, suicide story, I came to understand that the story that we know today of Hitler's suicide in the bunker was created uh, on command by MI6. British uh, intelligence had uh, hired uh, Hugh Trevor Roper, 
an historian who at mm. that point held a commission in British intelligence. He was a major uh, in the British uh, intelligence apparatus. And they said to him, um, you, have to, you have three months, three months' time in which to develop a story uh, that Hitler committed suicide. You have three months to prove this. Uh, you can have access to our prisoners of war, the Nazis we have uh, in internment. You probably won't have access to the, the ones the Soviets have, and mm. you won't have access to the ones the Americans have. And we know you don't speak German, but anyway, you have three months uh, in which to come up with the story and to prove to the world Hitler committed suicide in the bunker. We're calling this Operation Nursery, and you have this three-month window to do this. So Trevor Roper went out and did his three months and wrote a book which became famous, uh, you know, about the last days of, of Hitler and had a presentation to the world press showing the results of his research that proved beyond a shadow of a doubt that Hitler died in the bunker and committed suicide. Now, his sources for this did not include any forensic evidence at all because there wasn't any. Mm. All he had access to was eyewitness testimony, and the only eyewitnesses he had were members of the SS, mm. uh, those prisoners that he had in, in British uh, camps, prison camps. So he listened to all of these various stories of the, the, the suicide of Hitler. Some of them said he shot himself. Others said he took cyanide. Uh, one famous report has... Uh, Adolf Hitler on a couch with Eva Braun uh, resting against his shoulder, both of them dead, having taken cyanide. All of these stories, he sort of made a collage of them and then came out with his general story of the suicide of Adolf Hitler. Um, that was accepted by almost no one at the time, but at least it was the official word, the official explanation. Mm. But... This, but Yes. Yeah. So, so he basically got access to people who had motivation to, to say that, or maybe they were drilled even to say that uh, Hitler did sure commit suicide, and, and they even <laughs> didn't have their story straight. But what about those who would not say that? Did he have access to them, and then he just cherry picked, or how did this work? Oh, he cherry picked. Uh, even in his own writings, I mean, it's it's obvious that he was cherry picking those that he considered credible against those he considered not credible. Mm. How you can measure credibility when the only eyewitnesses you have are members of Hitler's inner circle? Yeah. I mean, what possible reason would they have to lie to you, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean. So we're talking about SS people. We're talking about some of the secretaries who were there, all people who were part of Hitler's entourage at the very end. Mm. Um, and they're all saying, oh, yes, Hitler's dead. Hitler's dead. When pressed for details, the details come out differently. Yeah. Um, and that's that right away should have been a red flag to anyone. It might have been a red flag to Trevor Roper. But remember, he was under orders mm. to produce a story that Hitler was dead and committed suicide. So that was his that was his mission. He accomplished it. And, you know, the world moved on, except that the world did not move on. Stalin kept insisting that the Allies had Hitler alive, that they were hiding him somewhere to be to be used against Russia at some later date. Uh, J. Edgar Hoover of the FBI was very suspicious about the stories of Hitler's suicide. And mm. we know famously, I mean, I've had access and other authors have had access to uh, the files, the FBI files on Hitler, which tell a completely different story. Mm. There was even, as I mentioned in uh, one of my books, in uh, actually in the Hitler Legacy, I think, that uh, the Allies were so convinced that Hitler had escaped that after the uh, defeat of Japan in World War II in 1945, which, remember, was months after the end of the war in Europe, mm -hmm. uh, in, in August and September of 1945, we sent, the United States sent uh, troops into occupied Japan looking for Hitler because they had had intelligence that said that Hitler had escaped uh, to someplace outside of Tokyo, and they actually sent troops looking for him there long after Trevor Roper had made his pitch that Hitler had died in the bunker. So obviously we were not taking that story for granted. We took it with a grain of salt. Uh, Eisenhower was a bit uh, suspicious about the story. Stalin, of course, was very suspicious. Mm. The British seemed to be totally confident with the fact that Hitler died in the bunker uh, because they had paid for that story anyway. It was their mission. 
but the rest of the world considered it doubtful. And there were Hitler sightings in Latin America that went on for a decade or more mm. after the end of World War II. It was always being reported in the press. Uh, this was something that went on and on forever and ever. And we could say it's like the Elvis sightings, except the Elvis sightings would have been relegated to the tabloid newspapers, to yeah. those that published anything. Whereas the Hitler sightings were being published in responsible, respectable uh, mainstream sources as possibly, you know, having something, uh, having a, an element of truth in them. So this is this is the environment in which I grew up, and I just assumed that the story of Hitler's suicide was was true. I especially thought it was true because of the date. It was April 30th, uh, 1945, and that was a very famous pagan holiday in Germany, Walpurgisnacht. Um, yeah, yeah. This was, you know, it was like Halloween. Mm -hmm. This was like a, a pagan holiday, Hitler being and, and Himmler and his entourage being famously involved with paganism and esotericism. Uh, I thought the date was picked specifically for that. And I wrote about that in Unholy Alliance. I took it for granted in my first book that Hitler committed suicide on that day. It wasn't until decades later that I came across another story and decided well, maybe, you know, the consensus reality is is not true. Maybe I have to look a little deeper. Yeah, so you changed the uh, attitude between those two books. Yes, absolutely. I was one of everyone who, you know, thought that Hitler's escape was a tinfoil hat kind of, uh, of story, that it was a mythology. Mm. Um, but it wasn't until about 2009 that I and a lot of other people, as it turned out, suddenly became aware that there was no forensic evidence to show that Hitler had died in the bunker. There was no forensic evidence to show that Hitler had died at all. No, no, we will get to that. But you're right, uh, an avalanche of Hitler escape books came uh, around the same time. Yeah. And uh, also um, our friend uh, Mr. Farrell had his own book out then around sure. that, I think, Nazi International. But you mentioned that <laughs> sightings in Japan. I mean, if he went instead of... Tokyo to Nagasaki or <laughs> Hiroshima, <laughs> yes. problem solved. Oh, convenient that would have been, yes. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, and, and also you're mentioning your books. We can just do that now too. There is three essential books here from Lavanda people that you ought to get. Now there is this one that we had a main focus on on our last program, uh, which is Unholy Alliance. Uh, history of Nazi involvement with the occult. So that's 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 a rather old book, isn't it? When did that come out? Uh, the very first time it came out was in 1994, and that was as a small rack size Avon paperback, which went in and out of uh, print rather rapidly. Uh, and then it was reissued by Continuum, uh, which is an academic publisher around 2002, I believe. And that's the one that has the foreword by Norman Mailer. Um, and it has a, a, some photographs and stuff that were not included in the original. Okay, so a little revised. Yes. Mm. Then came, the next one was Ratline. Yeah. Soviet spies, Nazi priests, and the disappearance of Adolf Hitler. And that book, people, will be our main focus today, even though we, we will collaborate with uh, stuff from the two other books too. When did Ratline come out? Uh, 2012 about three years ago yeah so that's rather recent yep. and the last book in this series is the hitler legacy the nazi cult in diaspora how it was organized how it was funded and why it remains a threat to global security in the age of terrorism rather long title there but oh yeah <laughs> and it's interesting because this book is dovetailing with uh, dr farrell's last book the third way yes both of you guys are uh, contributing to something very important that fortunately more and more people are, are, are starting to understand, and that is that the Nazi survival is not just a uh, academic curiosity, it's actually something that's impacting our world as we speak. And uh, it's such an important phenomenon that we're going to have uh, programs on that too in the future. And we hope to have you back also to cover that. Now, back to today's focus. You mentioned uh, Trevor Roper, who, who is the guy behind this myth then. Uh, you said that he was commissioned by the British intelligence M5 or, or was it six? I always mix those up. 
Yeah, I think it was MI5, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So MI5. Now, why? Why on earth would they want to pull out such a story? Do you have any idea about that? I think there were a number of reasons, uh, uh, some sort of geopolitical in nature and some more more probably uh, immediately pragmatic. And I think that it was necessary to prove this Hitler suicide story to get the Soviets uh, away from looking too deeply into what the British and the Americans, the Allies in general on the other side uh, had been up to uh, during the war. Remember, we had Alan Dulles in Switzerland negotiating with uh, people like uh, Himmler and some of the other Nazis, uh, especially in northern Italy. Uh, there was the transfer of funds and money that was taking place, the search for Nazi gold, um, dealings with the, uh, with the bank, the International Bank of, Sett bank of International Settlements in Switzerland. There was uh, a lot of other stuff going on we did not want the Soviets to probe too deeply into. And as long as they kept looking for Hitler, as long as they kept accusing the West – of hiding Hitler, of trying to play some game against the Soviets, mm -hmm. the more tensions were created and the more vulnerability that uh, British and American intelligence operations had if the Soviets probed too deeply. So I think what they wanted to do was settle this problem once and for all, get the Soviets off their back, number one. Number two, prove to the German people that there was no hope of any kind of Nazi resurgence, that their leader was dead. Mm -hmm. Not only was he dead, but he committed suicide. So there was no you know, hope that this, this, uh, this charismatic leader they had would come back uh, for a reborn, renewed Germany. Right. And I want to point out, uh, just because it's fascinating to me to, to, to realize this, that the OSS, which was the American forerunner to CIA, operating during World War II, had been looking into uh, Hitler's personality, what Hitler might or might not do, and the idea of spreading disinformation and propaganda among the German people in order to demoralize them. Mm -hmm. And one of the stories they came up with was that Hitler was insane and that he was going to commit suicide in this conflagration at the end of the war, like a kind of Götterdammerung. And this report came out in 1943. The OSS was already planting the seeds of Hitler's suicide two years before the end of World War II in Europe. Mm -hmm. So there was this idea in the air that uh, the story we're going to use is a Hitler suicide story, because at that point, the Germans, who would abhor the idea of suicide, mm. uh, especially being uh, at, at heart basically a Christian nation for whom suicide is, the, is an unpardonable sin, mm. to have Hitler commit suicide would pull the rug out from under any kind of Nazi resurgence. Right. So there were a lot of issues. You know, a lot of reasons why they wanted Hitler dead, mm. and they didn't want anybody looking too closely at the circumstances. Yeah, that makes sense. My, uh, before you said that, now, now I understand. It's actually effective war propaganda. And by the way, both sides did exactly that. Disinformation, trying to uh, discourage uh, and the morale uh, among the enemy, etc. So, so yeah. But <laughs> my conspiracy theory before before you gave me this ex explanation was that was the complete opposite actually, and that was that uh, the we know already that many Nazi leading Nazi people was integrated into the Western. Uh, uh, spy system into CIA, into NATO, you know, and, and of course Certainly. NASA, all this stuff. And we also know that many pro-Nazi people like the Dulles brothers were influential. So I was thinking they were helping Hitler, they were covering for him and also that by saying that he suicided, they look who, how brave and convicted he was. He actually wasn't afraid to die. He would rather die than let the scoundrels of the Allies get his hand on them. We remember the propaganda they used with Saddam Hussein and oh, yeah. Bin Laden, right? Sure. They were so cowardly that, oh no, they, <laughs> you know, so, so they didn't do this with Hitler. Uh, and so that was what I thought. But you're very right. The opposite can also work, namely that, yeah, we are a Christian nation. Suicide is sin. He took the easy way out. He, he left the German people behind. He abandoned them. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. So, so mm -hmm. yeah. I see the logic in that. It, it, it could work. It could work both ways, depending upon your demographic, depending <laughs> upon who you're talking to. Yeah. I mean, it was the perfect solution. 
yeah. really. Yeah. You know, nobody wanted there to be a live Hitler walking around, right? Mm. So this was the perfect solution, and you could spin it any way you wanted to, depending upon who you were talking to, as long as Hitler was dead. If mm. Hitler was alive, you have a lot of problems on your hands. Mm. Mm. You know, and you have the possibility, the specter of a resurgence of a Fourth Reich around, you know, uh, Hitler living in some other country and creating another uh, uh, another front in the war, which actually is what happened. But, um, you know, not in the way everybody expected. You had a front in North Africa in the Middle East. Yeah. Uh, you had another front growing in South America. So you did have other fronts, you know, that were being manipulated by surviving Nazis. So notwithstanding on an economic market, which uh, exactly. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but but uh, still, if if that is their intention, why didn't they just get rid of him then? Uh, I think they wanted to. I think there's quite a, a definite possibility that there was a desire to get rid of Hitler. Uh, I don't know if Hitler had any kind of uh, of leverage in which mm. he could remain alive, but a lot of Nazis did, as we know. Uh, we helped and we supported a great number of Nazis, uh, high-ranking Nazis, in their escape. Uh, if we didn't help them, we just looked the other way and allowed them to escape. Mm. So we were not really um, anti-Nazi at the end of World War II as much as people would like to think. We had a lot of deals with a lot of Nazis because we were more afraid of the Soviet Union. Uh, even the Catholic Church, as of course, as I point out in, in my books uh, since the beginning, was very complicit in helping Nazis escape and defending them uh, because they felt that the Nazis were their best line of defense against atheistic Soviet communism. Yeah. Um, so there's there's a lot of reasons to keep this uh, the idea of Hitler alive as opposed to Hitler dead, uh, especially if you were really concerned about the Soviet Union. Mm. That's right. And, and that uh, uh, boogeyman was squeezed for all it was worth uh, oh, yeah. during the whole Cold War. Now, we, we are getting a little ahead of ourselves. Let's let's retract to the facts again. You gave us a few facts about the Allied myth and how, you know, in the beginning, it's true. And most people don't realize that because uh, you have to be very old to remember. But yes, it's true. In the beginning, it was a lot of controversy around not just Hitler, but several of these uh, leading war criminals. But eventually this myth just grew and grew and became at some point established uh, fact uh, that you couldn't question. Uh, and I guess that dovetails also with the degeneration of critical academia. But <clears throat> if you look at the hard cold facts, and let's not dwell too long on this because we have others who will corroborate this, but what are the stone coal facts, the scientific circumstances around what we know about Hitler's fate? Well, the stone cold facts are, are facts that um, actually contradict the myth. Uh, it's interesting you use the word myth because that was the, uh, that was the KGB's uh, uh, name for their operation. It was called Operation Myth, just quite bluntly. And what this was was the um, the digging up of bodies at the Reich Chancellery, which they claimed initially was that of Hitler and, and the rest of the entourage. The Goebbels family, I think, is beyond doubt. They did find the Goebbels family completely. Uh, Goebbels and his wife and their six children and their dog, um, all of these bodies were discovered in the Reich Chancellery. What they had a problem with was the Hitler and Eva Braun corpses. They first showed a corpse, which they claimed was Hitler. Uh, it's a very famous photograph of Soviet troops standing around this particular body. Mm. Unfortunately, it turned out that body was not Hitler's at all, but one of Hitler's doubles, which immediately raises a concern. Mm. Uh, there were at least two known doubles of Adolf Hitler. One was found alive, and one, of course, was dead in Berlin. Well, what does that imply, right? Mm. If you have two doubles that you know of, there could be a dozen doubles. Who knows who committed? Actually, according to Gerard Williams of Grey Wolf, he says there's six doubles, and that yeah. one of them were used late at the war. I think when, uh, the most famous last sighting of Hitler when he gave out medals or something. Yes, yes. So, so this was an established tradition. Stalin oh, and yes. Hitler had doubles. Sure, which means that which means that Hitler could have disappeared long before yeah. April 1945. Yeah. Um, he could have been gone forever. I mean, he could have been gone you know, since 1944 when his own generals tried to kill him yeah. um, in that famous Val Operation Valkyrie. Yeah. So we know that Hitler trusted no one after July of 44. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. And he also, we also know the war was winding down, going against uh, the Third Reich in a very strong way. So it's ex- extremely possible that Hitler had decided to escape long before April 45. But even putting that aside, we have bodies that uh, Smersh, which was the counterintelligence arm of the KGB, which was uh, which was a counterintelligence arm of military, Soviet military intelligence rather. Um, they have, were the first ones at the Reich's Chancellery. They found the bodies of Goebbels and the family and this putative Hitler and Eva Braun. They dug up these bodies, which were very poorly cremated. They were not; uh, they were only partially burned. Mm. Dug up the bodies, put them in a truck, and then began an odyssey of carrying these bodies around Germany, digging them, digging a grave, digging graves for them, putting them in the earth, coming back a little later, digging them up again, putting them back in the truck, and then driving from town to town throughout what is became East Germany, until they reached Magdeburg, and they buried the, these bodies once and for all, in what became the parking lot of a KGB station in Magdeburg. Um, what was that all about? You know, digging the bodies up, planting them again, digging them up, planting them again, going around. I mean, and this is in the Soviets' own testimony. Mm-hmm. This is the Soviets' own intelligence reports. There's no explanation for why they did this. It's really, really, very strange. So now we fast forward to 2009. And a gentleman that I know, that I've known for a number of years, called Nick Bellantoni. Mm-hmm. He's a forensic uh, uh, archaeologist uh, for the state of Connecticut. We had uh, communicated on a different, completely different um, case some years ago, which involved uh, vampire burials in Connecticut, believe it or not. Um, and he was he was investigating the bodies that were found there of uh, people who, in the 19th uh, century, believed that uh, certain people had been vampires. And therefore, they were buried in very strange ways to make sure they wouldn't come out of their graves. So Nick and I had discussed this uh, a number of times back in the day, uh, in the 1990s. And then in 2009, I believe, he goes to Moscow to examine what they claim, what what the Soviets at that time claimed, or the Russians actually at this point, claimed was the skull of Adolf Hitler. Yeah, yeah, Yeah. let me just interject, because for, for many, many years, the... Last line of defense for the established myth is that the Soviets had a skull yes. and they had established that this was Hitler's skull. Yeah. But then came, was it History Channel or someone who, who published this? Uh, is this guy you're talking about now connected to that? Uh, exactly. He was part of that, that ah, famous show. He, yeah, was the, okay. he was the scientist they sent to look at the skull. Right. So uh, Dr. Bellantoni went to Moscow. He examined the skull with the bullet hole in it and managed to take a piece of the skull away with him, hmm. which is which is very dangerous because had he been caught doing that, there might have been a problem. So he took a piece of the skull back. He, he knew from looking at the skull there was something very wrong hmm. with the assumption that this was Hitler's skull. Hmm. But when he took it back and had it examined, uh, tested scientifically at the laboratories in Connecticut, the the results were astounding. In the first place, it was not the skull of a man but of a woman. <laughs> and in the second place, it could not have been Eva Braun because of the age of the skull and everything else. This was just the skull of an unfortunate victim who had been shot in the head, mm. probably in Berlin at some point, but had no relation whatsoever to Adolf Hitler, which meant suddenly in 2009, there is no forensic evidence anywhere in the world that Hitler was even dead, much less that he died in the bunker. Hmm. So uh, the pro-suicide story has nothing per today to back it up all you have is eyewitness testimony which is extremely contradictory the soviets remember had their own nazi prisoners of war Mm. and they were torturing them and interrogating them to find out what had happened to hitler and they kept getting different stories even from people they were torturing and then we had prisoners the british had prisoners everybody had prisoners none of these stories matched when the soviets finally released some of their nazi prisoners they went out to give their story what happened to Hitler until they were told, wait a minute, wait a minute, the story you're giving doesn't match the stories that everybody else is telling. Yeah, yeah. So you better change your story to fit yeah. the accepted reality, accepted story, which they did then. I mean, right. it's a mess. It's a mess yeah, of it eyewitness testimony, no forensic data at all. And then, most intriguingly, in 1970, Yuri Andropov, at that point as head of the KGB, and for reasons unknown to anybody, he 
sends out an order to the KGB, dig up those bodies underneath the parking lot at Magdeburg at our KGB headquarters there, our KGB office. And have the bodies cremated again. Destroy them, the evidence. Destroy them mm. completely. Scatter their ashes into the River Elba. And no one knows why he gave that order. This was no, when? 1970. Hmm. This was in April of 1970 hmm. that this order was given. Why was it necessary to do this? No one even knew about the location of those bodies except the KGB. Hmm. Why would it be necessary to dig up the bodies? They were underneath a, a paved parking lot in the middle of nowhere, right? Mm -hmm. So they had to send in people in the middle of the night with trucks and everything else. They dug up the bodies, took them out into the fields, cremated them again, uh, destroyed them utterly, and scattered their ashes in the River Elba. Um, in my book, Ratline, I, I offer an opinion as to why this might have been so, um, because of my research that took place in Indonesia, and that's another story. Mm. Uh, but it, it dovetails with this, because I had heard rumors that Hitler had escaped had survived and wound up in Asia instead of in South America, and that's what got me involved in the story. So, but to, to stop it at this point, I would just like to say that there was no reason for Andropov to do this that we that we know of, mm -hmm. and the very idea that he was cremated and ashes scattered into the sea recalled later another incident that happened when Osama bin Laden was killed. Mm -hmm. uh, Osama bin Laden, according to the story, was uh, killed by SEAL Team Six. Uh, his body was brought to, to on board ship, and then his body was uh, dumped overboard uh, into the sea. And of course, there's no no one's ever seen the body. There's been no evidence the body you know existed, etc. There's all kinds of conspiracy theories around that. Mm -hmm. But Osama bin Laden was killed, according to the story, almost the same day that Hitler supposedly committed suicide. Mm -hmm. Hitler's suicide was April 30th. Osama bin Laden was attacked. His compound was attacked on May 1st. Mm -hmm. Uh, and either died on late at night at May 1st or died on May 2nd. Mm. And then both bodies wound up in, in water. Hitler's in the River Elba, according to the Soviets anyway. And, uh, of course, Osama bin Laden someplace in, I guess, the Mediterranean. Sounds like a magical ritual. <laughs> it does sound like it, doesn't it? It's very strange. Mm. But, um, okay, there, there's something going on behind the scenes here, uh, for sure. Uh, by 1970, Hitler would most likely have been dead anyway. But we'll get back to, to your take on that in Asia and stuff. Uh, if we look at the Russians then, w one would think that Stalin, who was so paranoid, with good reason, uh, especially about the surviving Nazis, because as you alluded to in the beginning, very early on, even before the war was over officially, the allied or, or, or powerful interests within the Western powers already had pointed out Soviet as the new enemy and were frantically busy whitewashing uh, leading Nazis. And as we all know, and as you and Joseph and many have written about, uh, many essential Nazis survived. They had these, some of these more crazy people, the more passionate people, the symbolic people. They were tried in the Nuremberg courts, but essential Nazis like Bormann got away. And um, so one would think that when they are setting up this new half-Nazi Western powers, and, and Stalin ob obviously knows about this, one would think that Stalin would want to expose the facts. And um, so isn't it so, and, and I, I can see, I can appreciate the problems for the people working for Stalin, because, you know, you, 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 very little you could do before you were taking out and shot, right? Yes, exactly. <laughs> so so to, to provide a truth for Stalin... You know, he, he would have to be happy, right? So it's very hard. And torturing people, you say they give different stories. Well, we know that torture doesn't work. We know yes. that leads to different stories. So the Soviets would have a hard... So I believe that at some point, and I want you to comment on this, at some point, someone high in the system were faring for, for themselves and their own asses. So they decided to manufacture a story to give to Stalin so that they would be in the clear. That's, that's what I'm thinking about this. Certainly, and I think that the, the, the Soviet intelligence apparatus was exactly that type of organization that had the, the intelligence, no pun intended, to understand <laughs> where, where their 
position was in the Soviet hierarchy and how vulnerable they were to Stalin. And at the same time, they did control access to secrets that even Stalin would not have known. So I think that the skull with the bullet hole in it was just exactly a piece of manufactured evidence uh, to show to Stalin to say, look, here's, here's Hitler's skull, here's the bullet because he shot himself. Remember, one of the stories, the most common story, was that he took cyanide. Um, but here we have a skull with a bullet hole in it. And the manufactured story around that was that Hitler did both. He swallowed cyanide. He bit into a cyanide capsule, and then he shot himself. <laughs> um, and Stalin bought this, uh, evidently, at least at least quietly. He didn't tell the Allies that he believed it, no. but he may have believed it internally, even though it's virtually impossible for someone who has taken cyanide to shoot themselves in the head. They couldn't hold a gun. They couldn't aim it. They couldn't pull the trigger because they would be in the throes of a terrible seizure. They'd be foaming at the mouth, which is another reason why Eva Braun was not sitting nicely on the couch with her head on Hitler's shoulder mm. after having taken cyanide. She would have been in a horrible mess on the floor of the bunker after having done this. None of the stories make sense. None of them. You know, the cyanide story doesn't make sense. The bullet hole story doesn't make sense. None of this really amounts to anything. But they showed Stalin a skull with a hole in it. And Stalin said, well, OK, are you sure this is Hitler's? Oh, yes, absolutely. You know, we found Goebbels. We found Eva. We found everybody. What they didn't say was that they found Hitler's dentist. Right. And that Hitler and Eva Braun both, Hitler had very bad teeth. He only had maybe two or three teeth left in his skull uh, at the time uh, of April 45. Oh. So everything he had were, were, was dentures. Oh. Eva Braun also had you know, dent, uh, uh, dentures as well. Mm. This dentist made two sets for each, Hitler and Eva Braun, two sets of dentures for both of them in April of 1945. Okay. One set was found in the putative corpses that they found at the Reich's Chancellery, but the dentures did not fit into the skulls in which they were found. Mm. They were sort of stuck into uh, the, uh, two bodies. Uh, and this was going to prove that this was Hitler and Eva because the dental records would match. But no one knows what happened to the other set, hmm. the real set that evidently Hitler and Eva were actually wearing at the time of their escape. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. So th there's two sets of dentures. I mean, this is like an old insurance scam. You know, <laughs> you throw a couple of bodies in a car with your dental yeah, records and yeah. push it off a cliff and, you know, you get your you get your insurance money. This Rather is amateurish, actually. R rather. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Even for that time, because mm. the, the, the skulls and the dentures didn't fit. A further problem is the dentist who was identified as having done all this was not actually the dentist. It was a dental technician and the dental technician drew the dentures from memory for the Soviets, for Smersh. How is that possible? Exactly. Oh, so right, right, right. in other words, there's mm. faked dental records, faked dentures that don't fit the corpses in which they were found. Two sets of dentures, those records exist, that two sets of dentures each were made in April of 45 as the Soviets were at the border, right? Mm -hmm. As they were coming into Berlin, as the whole Reich was in danger of falling apart, Hitler and Eva decide they need a pair of dentures, not only one pair each, but two. Mm -hmm. What is that all about, yeah. right? They're obviously expecting to survive the war. Yeah. And uh, I guess they found a better dentist uh, down in Argentina. Yeah, eventually. yes. <laughs> yeah, I hope so, yeah. yeah. But, um, okay, so, uh, but what do we have on the other side of facts? I mean, you have mentioned a lot already, but let's, let's just go uh, quickly through it. What do we have to substantiate that he did survive? I'm not sure, by the way, if you just saw the news now that uh, they found uh, this tunnel under the bunker, which they think that he escaped in. It's rather new nope, story. Also. I haven't heard. No, nope. this is just interesting. Okay. Yeah, I'll send it to you. So it's it's more or less coincidental. It's uh, connected to the German subway, and it was just a, a, a thin fake wall that was very easy to to. And and I do think that Jared Williams talked about this already a few years ago. But now they found it actually. But uh, let alone that, what else do we have if we just collect? On the other side of the argument, what we have to, to that indicates that uh, a survival is highly likely here. Well, we have one fascinating uh, story, which is that of uh, Hannah Reich, 
Uh, Hannah Reich was a famous pilot, a female pilot, very well known uh, in Nazi Germany. She was uh, uh, she was admired greatly by Adolf Hitler. And one of the stories was that Hitler could not possibly have escaped by plane uh, because Berlin was encircled. Uh, the Soviets were you know, blasting everything out of the sky. But Hannah Reich actually flew into Berlin just days before uh, Hitler's supposed suicide and tried to convince Hitler to go out with her, that she could fly them out of, uh, out of Berlin. Um, now, according to the story, Hitler refused for whatever reason. But Hannah Reich's uh, interrogation by the Allies is extremely interesting. She was picked up near the area of Salzburg in Austria, which was going to be the site of the last holdout, the last national redoubt, as they called it, a kind of an underground fortress where the Third Reich would make its last stand. Mm -hmm. uh, Hannah Reich was captured there. So many high-ranking Nazis were captured there. Everybody was gathering there for this final stand. And when Hannah Reich was captured, uh, she was interrogated, and she talked, they asked her specifically about this idea that Hitler could have escaped to this underground uh, headquarters in Austria. Mm -hmm. And she she said quite clearly that it had been discussed in the bunker, that preparations had been made, uh, that there was a national redoubt, that there was an underground site, mm -hmm. and that they were talking about it, which was what Hannah was going to do. She was going to fly him out and take him to, to Salzburg, and, and they were going to go into the national redoubt. That was one of the stories that she talked about. Huh. But she did fly into Berlin, and then she flew out. You know, and then wound up in Austria. So her specific story uh, shows beyond a shadow of a doubt that it was possible to fly out of Berlin, even as the, the Soviets were encircling the city. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of evidence that leads to the fact that he could have gotten out just for that reason alone, plus his high ranking, uh, like people like Ernst Kaltenbrunner. Mm -hmm. uh, who was uh, running the SS under Himmler at that time. He was at the National Redoubt. He was in near Salzburg when he was arrested, um, a very uh, obvious figure. I mean, he's, he's not somebody who could have disguised himself well. He was way over six feet, had a dueling scar on his chin and the whole thing, mm -hmm. but he was trying to pretend that he was a German doctor, and he had German doctor's papers and even a medical bag with him right. when they arrested him in the Alt Alze, and he was on his way to to also to the National Redoubt. So they were picking these people up. Skorzeny was down there. Otto Skorzeny was arrested in the same general area as Hannah Reich. Um, there were all these individuals congregating there to make their last stand for the Reich. And there was this idea that Hitler had escaped. Skorzeny insisted that there's no way Hitler committed suicide, that Hitler had escaped. He told that to his interrogators. Uh, a lot of captured uh, Germans refused to believe the story. Mm -hmm. uh, that there was any kind of a suicide, they believed that Hitler had escaped, and this was giving the Soviets a lot of um, a lot of nightmares and ulcers when they kept hearing the story of the of the escape of Hitler, because they're now looking at the Allies. General Patton very famously demanded of uh, uh, of, of his president of um, of Truman at the point at that time mm -hmm. that um, he be allowed to take his troops and the captured German troops that he had under in camps and take them and invade Moscow. Um, yeah. Patton was saying we were pointing our guns in the wrong direction. General Patton wanted to invade Russia immediately. Mm -hmm. So the Soviets knew that they were under attack from all different quarters. They had just lost 20 million people yeah. during World War II. Uh, it's doubtful they could have withstood a major Allied assault. Uh, even if they had, it would have cost them dearly. Mm -hmm. So this idea that Hitler might still be alive was a very emotional one for the, for the Russian people. Yeah, uh, didn't Stalin uh, complain about this uh, until his death, that he was convinced that Hitler got away? Yes, he did. Uh, and he wasn't the only one. Marshal Zhukov, the very famous Soviet general, also was demanding to know the truth about mm. Hitler's, uh, Hitler's escape. But yes, Stalin believed that there had been an escape. Uh, now, whether he was doing that because it was useful propaganda, yeah. or whether he was doing that because he actually believed it, we don't mm. know. Mm. But... Remember, that, remember, Smersh was telling him that Hitler had died in the bunker. We have the bodies. It's it's a no-brainer. We know this. Mm -hmm. And the British were telling him that. Stalin, however... Yeah, but he didn't trust the British. He didn't trust. He didn't, no, of course, he didn't trust the British at all. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's doubtful whether he trusted his own people. You know, so as we know, he had so many of them killed yeah. uh, over the decades. So, But what could he do when even his own people eventually said, no, no, it's over? He could, uh, I mean, he couldn't kill the whole KGB, <laughs> he, he, well, that's but, it. but he continued to complain about it, didn't he? 
He did. He was never mm. convinced. Mm, mm. Uh, his own KGB, it was, it was impossible for them to convince him that Hitler was dead. And why then would Andropov, you know, years later, give this order, 25 years after the end of the war, to dig up the bodies and destroy them? And after, and, and I mean, I could understand it if he was working under Stalin, but at that point, Stalin yes. was dead. So something is going on behind the scenes here. And, and I think it's related to the post-war extraterritorial Nazi state because uh, I think from all the evidence you, Farrell and others that we could mention but it's a long list of researchers have uncovered there's been some kind of covert behind the scenes uh, dare I say the word war but at least uh, dealings and operations which uh, goes into corporations globalism all that and at some point I think all intelligence services in the world knew what was going on and who the players was. And I, and I think, and this is just, I'm taking it out of my ass, but based on these uh, things that are out there now, that for whatever reason, it was related to some of the behind-the-scenes shenanigans. Because you don't just do such an operation for nothing, for no reason, from out of nowhere. No, no, of course not. I mean, something this major, something this dramatic mm. had to have been agreed upon by people who or the people who control these things, the people in power. This was not something that was done by some low-level functionary somewhere mm -hmm. who says, let's, let's see if we can get Hitler out of the country. <laughs> this had to be done, you know, at the highest levels. There's no way that Hitler could have escaped uh, otherwise. There had to be some kind of collusion. Uh, remember, there was enough of escape, an escape route, and I write about it in Ratline, of course, and others have as well. There's a, there was enough of an escape route that we were pushing a lot of people out through the monastery route through northern Italy, uh, into Spain, Portugal, and beyond. Uh, there were even escape routes in Scandinavia, in, uh, in Amsterdam, and in Denmark. There were ways for people to get out. There was actually a, a, a cabal of uh, Catholic priests in Amsterdam that were running a little operation of their own to get Nazis out of that part of, of, of Europe. So we have a monastery route connection, we have the church connection. They were very invested in making sure the Nazis would escape to fight another day. Uh, they saw that communism was spreading around the world and having Nazis scattered around the world themselves was a very useful thing to have. So there's a, there was a lot of reasons, uh, number one, to help all Nazis escape, especially those who had proven themselves, which means the SS, yeah. which was declared a criminal organization. So they had reasons to escape. But also because they were SS, they had proven their loyalty uh, mm -hmm. to the Reich and to the ideals of the Third Reich to the ideals of the Nazi Party, so we they had to to let these guys escape. Um, Hitler would have been one of you know many people they were trying to to rescue, but at the same time Hitler would have been the most valuable. Um, he would have been the person that was the figurehead. If Hitler walked yeah. into a room in 1950, you know, mm. uh, a, a room full of, of Nazis, a of former SS, and told them what they had to do, mm. I don't think anybody would have. Even though he had no longer any any temporal power, or political power, his the mere presence of his of, of the fact of his life, the fact of his survival, uh, would have been enough to get them to do whatever it was that he wanted them to do. Uh, so I think this was a very valuable thing to have. An escaped Hitler yeah. uh, was it was a was a sword that cut both ways. You know, it is a double-edged sword. Uh, he could be difficult to deal with, impossible to command on the one hand, mm. uh, a, a chimerical coming up with his own ideas as how to run a post-war world. Uh, and on the other hand, though, a tremendous uh, magnet for not only the Nazis, but for neo-Nazis, for those who are of a newer generation, uh, someone to, yeah. to incite their admiration. And we found that in the United States uh, among neo-Nazi organizations that I investigated mm. uh, personally in the 1970s and the 1980s. You would find you know, paintings, portraits of Hitler everywhere yeah. among the neo-Nazis and among the Klan as well, the Ku Klux Klan and others. Mm. Hitler's, his mere, you know, uh, the portrait was enough uh, to get respect, to get awe, to get this kind of hero worship. Um, it wasn't just, you know, Mein Kampf and it wasn't just uh, the Nuremberg rallies. It was actually Hitler himself considered as a kind of spiritual leader, as a kind of avatar. Yeah, because we're talking about a cult here. Yes. And this is the guru, the, the avatar. 
Exactly. The prophet. We can't imagine this in any other. I mean, who has pictures of Stalin, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know? or, or Churchill. Or, or Churchill. Or, Roosevelt or whatever. Or whatever yeah. No, mm. it's impossible, right? Mm. But mm. Hitler was the leader of a cult. And this, this more than anything else, mm. I think, demonstrates that fact. Mm. But uh, I have a scenario here. I want your, your take on that. I think that uh, the brilliant genius, evil brilliant genius that was uh, Bormann, he planned, or as we know, uh, the escape, and you know, much looks like he he got uh, the essential Kamler stub over to Argentina. Now, yeah. I think that he chose to bring with him Hitler because of insurance, because he couldn't be sure that he could pull this off after the war, and that he needed this symbolic, like you just pointed out, uh, Hitler was the, for all intents and purposes the energetical power of the Nazis. So. You know, if without Hitler, who would rally around Bormann, right? But on the other hand, as you also pointed out, Hitler is probably impossible to control. But easier now that Bormann is an unknown and wanted to be, uh, you know, a grey eminence behind the scene. So that means that it's easier for Bormann to operate in South America after the war, whereas Hitler needs to be hidden away. And in that way, if he could cut, if he could have monopoly access to Hitler, mm -hmm. he could control this because then Hitler would just be this deluded old crazy man and everything went through Bormann, much more vulnerable now, much more now than during the war in Germany. So that Bormann both wanted to get rid, he wanted Hitler to just wither away in the shadows while he built up his, his Bormann empire, his Fourth Reich. What do you think about that scenario? No, it's perfectly reasonable to me. I mean, one of the things that is a mystery to us is what was Hitler's mental and physical state in April of 1945? Exactly. We actually don't have a lot of information on this. We don't have credible medical reports. Uh, he was being treated by a quack doctor called Morel, mm -hmm. who was dosing him with all sorts of wild uh, medications and drugs, uh, hallucinogens and narcotics and everything else. Um, we don't have a really definitive um, – uh, uh, analysis of Hitler's condition physically. People were saying he had Parkinson's disease, but he was never diagnosed by any doctor as having Parkinson's. This is just something people were saying. Mm. Um, as far as his mental state, his mental, his psychological state, again, since July of 44 until April of 45, in that one period of time, Hitler doesn't show up, right? Hitler is staying hidden in his bunker. Um, Allegedly, anyway, uh, he's surrounded by his own people. No one really knows what his mental and physical condition was. It's very possible that when he escaped, if he escaped, uh, he's, his health was at least good enough for him to, to get out of, of Berlin and out of Germany. Mm. Uh, mentally, uh, if he was even 10% of what he was in his heyday, he would have been uh, sane enough to have accommodated all the, the requirements of getting out of the country, of maybe shaving off his mustache, you know, mm. um, changing his appearance slightly and getting out. And then he would have found himself, as you say, more or less in the hands of people like Bormann and some of the others who escaped, who would have, um, you know, rallied around him in front of him saying, oh, yes, mein Fuhrer, everything's going to be fine. We're going to have our new Fourth Reich and all of this, but keeping him pretty much under wraps. Uh, maybe using Morel's drugs, keep him drugged, mm. you know, for, for, for half the time. So he, he could not become a problem. And then but using him, trotting him out when necessary to get everybody to, you know, genuflect uh, and, and, you know, and follow orders and then mm. put him back in a box somewhere, uh, you know, and just go. Yeah, brushing dust off him when they have so many important yeah. meetings yeah. and then back to the closet with him. Yeah, it makes excellent sense, yeah. you know, yeah. especially as he was getting older and older. Yeah. Uh, as you say, by 1970, he might have been dead already. It's an interesting fact, but uh, the story that I worked on in Ratline concerns a German or an actually an Austrian like Hitler, an Austrian uh, uh, national. Here was a person of the same age, coming from relatively the same background, who did survive into 1970, mm. you know, and survived well and was, you know, reasonably healthy at that time. So Hitler could have been healthy at least up until 1970. Uh, you know, if nobody shot at him or poisoned him or anything else. Well, when was he born again? Do you remember? Uh, off the top of my head, it was 1895, I think, if I'm not mistaken, or about wow. that time. Wow, he could have lived uh, 
sure. technically into 1995, maybe. <laughs> he wasn't even 60 years old when the war was over. Wow. You know, so, I mean, uh, he was he was young enough, you know, yeah. so he could have he, if he was not physically debilitated by something that we don't know about, um, he could have escaped. Plus, remember, Ava Brown is the key to all of this because no one knew about Ava Brown in 1945. She was Hitler's best kept secret. Only the inner circle knew about Eva Braun's existence. Okay, so this is a post-war revelation. That's exactly. Ah. There were no photographs of Hitler and Eva Braun before the end of the war. Hitler's whole point was he did not want to be shown as married to anyone. Of course, he was not with Eva. He didn't want to be connected with a woman in the popular mind because he wanted women's adulation, right? If they thought he was single, that they still had a chance mm. with the Fuhrer that he would be more popular. This is a very well thought out uh, campaign. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's it's still an established psychology in, in some countries in the East, in Asia. I just read about someone who lost her or his contract as a musician, a pop star, because it was revealed that he or she had a, a partner, a boyfriend, a yeah. girlfriend. So this is this is mass psychology. This is Goebbels' uh, yes. understanding of the masses. Well, to cre create a hero, a godlike person, you need to keep him pure. You yeah. need to let people project anything. I mean, the same happened to Jesus. Most likely he was married yes. to Mary Magdalene. <laughs> We can't yes. have that. Right. <laughs> what about all the poor nuns? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> and homosexual exactly. uh, priests. Oh, my no, goodness. Yeah. It all falls apart, doesn't it? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, the same thing with Hitler. No one knew about Eva Brown. Mm. So if Hitler was going to escape with Eva, remember, nobody's looking for a married couple. Mm. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And Eva was younger than Hitler. She was this tall, blonde. I guess she was considered attractive in those days. So here's this a tall, blonde woman with this little guy, you know, who had shaved off his mustache, most likely, because that was the most obvious thing about Hitler. Mm. And, you know, if he was sick, I my scenario is he's in a wheelchair being pushed by a nurse mm. who's Eva Braun. Right. Yeah. No one's looking for Eva Braun. They're looking for Hitler. They should have been looking for Eva because Eva would have been the key, I think, to mm. finding Hitler. Mm. But how hard do you think they wanted to find him? Because, uh, OK, in 45, 46, I guess the Allied uh, powers were still uh, intact. But I think, uh, and especially as I've had program with Joseph about this, that at some point the power balance changed, that there is a war behind the scenes between because the Nazi network survives and it's heavily integrated, especially in the American system. Now, at some point, you could question who's in charge. I mean, CIA is stenching of Nazi influence, fascism, uh, not just because of Alan Dulles and all that, but, but, you know, just how it all develops. So at some point, I feel that maybe the incentive to reveal that this uh, Nazi international still exists, that that incentive is gone and that maybe they are protected by their very own Western uh, oh, yes. powers. Well, as, as I as I discuss and as other historians have discussed in, in, in sort of obscure texts, you know, by 1946, everything had already changed. Mm -hmm. The uh, the counterintelligence corps, the CIC, which was the Army a Counterintelligence Organization in Salzburg, Austria, uh, which was the American zone at that time. Mm. These were the people who were in charge of hunting Nazis uh, and bringing them to justice. By, 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 the, by late 1946, the word had come down, stop looking for Nazis to prosecute, start looking for Nazis to hire. Wow. I mean, this was, this was only a year after the end of the war, maybe 18 months after April, May of 45, the war in Europe, where suddenly the CIC gets the, gets the, the word, we're looking for Nazis to use against the Soviets, against, the, against their, their, their satellite countries and all the rest of it. Find out you know, who we can use. I mean, the Galen organization was already being, you know, groomed mm. uh, to run CIA's. The CIA wasn't founded even until 1947. But the Galen people were already being groomed to use as uh, espionage and saboteurs uh, against the Soviet Union. Uh, by 1946, and then again in 1947, at the latest, uh, suddenly you have the American CIC involved with people like Klaus Barbie, mm. not to arrest them, not to send them to jail, but to use them as spies against the Soviets. And then eventually, as we know, and it's very well documented, we enabled 
uh, Barbie to escape. We gave him the documents. We did what we could to help get Barbie out of Europe in the 1950s when he was no longer that valuable. Mm. And he winds up in Bolivia, having gone through the monastery route, which was centered in Salzburg. It's very important to remember that Salzburg was the heart of this mm. at that in the late 1940s. Salzburg was the major node on the rat line, on the escaping Nazis. Uh, it was being run by a, a priest, a uh, Croatian uh, priest called Krunoslav Draganovic. He was helping first his Croatian Nazis to escape, and then later, using that same network, helping everybody else to escape. Mm. And he became a CIA asset. Mm. By the 1960s, this guy, who was a Nazi, who was an avowed Nazi, who was helping people like Barbie, Mangala, uh, Franz Stangl, Eric Priebke, Walter Ralph, all these guys to escape, mm. was actually working for CIA as well. Mm. So we know that the embeddedness, as, you, as you're talking about, the stench of the fascism and Nazism within CIA mm. was there since really the very beginning. And NATO, right? Oh, and NATO, of course, mm. and Interpol. Mm. Uh, I mean, all of these... And, of course, the, the banking system and the Bank yeah, of International yeah. Settlements, you know, it's it's heartbreaking to read what was going on in Switzerland, mm. uh, you know, with the Bank of International Settlements, because mm. suddenly you had, you know, a bank that was run by Nazis used, being used to launder money mm. uh, for the Nazis. But the president was an American, Thomas Kittrick, mm. you know, and who's reporting back to his people in the United States as late as 1944. Mm. Don't worry about the Nazis. Everything's under control. There will be no problems, you know, with, with the money and with the investments and everything else. He's telling American investors to keep investing in Nazi Germany through his bank. Yeah, and Germany itself had many leading Nazis. Many people from Goebbels' propaganda ministry went straight into the new uh, so-called democratic Western yep. Germany. Sure. And, and it's re been revealed, uh, even in the last 20, 30 years, there was just a scandal, actually, that uh, some Nazi guy in the... Um, I, I don't know what it's called in Germany, but the, the police who surveils, he had to go off because he they were... Uh, encouraging neo-Nazis, and then uh, oh, yeah. He was, yeah, and he was replaced by one of the uh, City of London bankster loyal guys. So we've seen, and 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 he, one of Goebbels' guys, Joseph Tolos, in a program became the <laughs> the president of Germany. So we we see they pop up everywhere, and they are rehabilitated. And if you look at the, I, I was reading through after our last talk, you told me about this strange thing about Hess and what he said in the Nuremberg trial. So I was reading up on that, right? Yeah. And then I noticed that many of these people who were sentenced, obviously they needed to sentence some people. Uh, by the way, extremely many went free without a sentence. But when you look at those who were sentenced, a lot of them got out early, very oh, yeah. early. Everyone actually but Rudolf Hess. <laughs> yes, exactly. And, and this is a part because now in the 50s and the 60s, who cares? It's behind us. Now it's the Soviets, right? Right. Well, look at Reinhard Galen. I mean, here's here's a man who was running, you know, Nazi counterintelligence and running operations against the Soviets during World War II, a dedicated Nazi, if ever there was one. Mm. We hire him. The CIA hires him to run basically their Eastern European operations using all of his Nazi comrades. We're talking about a large organization of Nazi intelligence agents. And then slowly, the Galen organization transforms into West Germany's intelligence organization. Suddenly, the BVD is, you know, West Germany's own uh, uh, CIA, which means that the Galen organization and all of those Nazis now had access not only to West Germany and to you know whatever's going on in Europe, but now they're the equivalents of our CIA, our FBI. Yeah. Uh, Interpol and everything else, they now have access to all sorts of databases, all sorts of networks that they would never have had before all around the world because now they're the state intelligence agency fighting against the Soviet Union. So their prestige grows tremendously. They have all of this access. Suddenly the Nazis have access to things they would never have dreamed they would have had during the Third Reich. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, 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 it's amazing. It boggles the mind. It does. And, and then we know that they report directly to the leaders, to the president in the USA, without any filters. Yes. He gets Nazi information. The same with the president in Germany. Now, 
if we are a little conspiratorial here, but but it's not actually a far stretch because it is the logical consequence of all that's uncovered. But there is this Nazi network surviving the war. They are true believers and in touch with each other. I mean, you're a primary research guy. You have found notebooks, address books. You know about these things. You've written about these things. Now, these people, they're still true believers. But they have this double role. On the one hand, they have this internal connection all over the world, a global Nazi organization, Nazi state. And on the other hand, they are at key positions in Western powers. Now, you would have to be a moron not to realize that this is exploited. This is used. This serves to build up their own interests. Of course, of course. As I as I mentioned, in, as early as Unholy Alliance, so we're talking now more than 20 years, mm-hmm. the Nazi party is a cult. It's a cult of true believers. And the SS is the high priest, the high priesthood of that cult. Mm-hmm. So we're talking about the SS are the ones who escape for the most part. Um, these are people who are really true. They're not giving up the faith. They didn't give up just because they lost the war. They just moved their theater of operations. Mm. So they they moved to the Middle East. They moved to South America. They moved around the world, other parts of Europe. They maintained networks all over the place. The Nazis had established networks all over the world in the 1930s, as early as the 1930s, through a system called the German House, the Deutsche House, all over Uh, South America, there's maps showing their locations all over the world. Mm. This was how they began to export their Nazi ideology. They replaced ambassadors uh, and consular officials in all the German embassies when Hitler came to power. So only Nazi party, uh, trusted Nazi party officials were put in charge of embassies around the world. Mm. Um, This whole thing became an ideological network that was very, very far reaching. So when the war is over, or as the war is winding down, they are expatriating money, personnel, artifacts, uh, technology, documentation, uh, machinery, uh, setting up uh, uh, subsidiary operations all over the world. Mm. The United States government in 1946 was making an investigation just in the United States alone. How many German companies had subsidiaries in the United States? There was more than 400 German companies set up in the U.S. in the years before the war, Mm. including companies like AEG and some of the famous companies, you know, Tyson, Krupp, Mm. Siemens, everybody was there, you know, former Nazi party leaders in charge of these of these uh, 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 subsidiaries. And not just, of course, in the United States, but in Latin America and Asia, all, all over the world, Africa, the Middle East. They had already expatriated the wealth of their technology and their, their physical wealth, their tangible assets as well, mm. through the Bank of International Settlements, but also through smuggling gold out you know, throughout, mm. the, throughout the world. So put all of that together with suddenly they've come to their own in, West German, uh, in, in, in the West German government. You know, they're running now the West German government for the most part, yeah. which means they have access to all the Western governments, which means that they're able to, to pool their resources around the world. And conduct things like and manipulate and uh, manipulate exactly yeah. mm. manipulate our, our I mean we have uh, the World Anti Communist League in the United States uh, for for many years very powerful and the captured nations organizations and stuff which were designed for ethnic groups that had been whose countries had been taken over by the Soviets um, on the face of it this is very nice it's very uh, benign these are people whose countries have been uh, taken over by the soviets they're getting together to raise consciousness about this on the one hand you scratch a little deeper and there's former nazis involved they're manipulating the american political system in this particular case for those ends uh the world anti-communist league became a hotbed of nazi uh, war criminals who were trying to influence the american political uh theater uh, for their own purposes so it's you know, the more you dig around in this, the, the, the more you find. Uh, it's it's not that you 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 don't have enough information. You actually have too much information. <laughs> yeah. And, and now the the big question, and I, and I think the reason they got away with it is because even though most Western insiders know about this, yeah, yeah, there's a lot of Nazis everywhere, but they use for reusing them. Oh, the big scary Soviets. But the, I think the big problem is that few people realized. I think you had to be very high up on the insider to realize that it wasn't just 
a million fragmented Nazis who worked for us, but that they had a command structure intact, that there were people on the top who probably in Argentina or, or, or at least somewhere away from the uh, headlights were calling the shots. So you have a fifth column, if there ever was one, within the Western system. Now, if people who listen to this accept the fact that, you know, just consider the evidence that you and others have provided and realize, OK, so they did survive. OK, so they did survive organized. So they did continue as true believers. Then they have to end with the conclusion that this has to affect the world. It's not just a curiosity that slowly disappears during the 60s and the 70s. Now, we'll not discuss that too much today because we can have our own program on that. But I want to just quickly interject and, and have your take on it too, that I think that because of many of these more exotic and crazy Nazis like Himmler, uh, like Hess, you know, these people who were visionary Nazis, so to speak, they were rid of. And the Aparochkis, the more capitalist oriented, the more down to earth, cynical, calculated people that Bormann is the uh, main example of, that they were the one who called it shots. Even Hitler, even if he survived, he didn't have a direct influence on the Nazi network. Now, the, the reason I'm going this way is to ask your opinion on how do you look at the should we say, post-Nazi philosophy? Because to me, it seems that some of the more, should we say, exotic and impractical notions were toned down, like the the rabiat anti-Semitism, the, some of these racial things, that they're more like, a more, should I say, more classical fascist philosophy. And, and especially when new generations come in, right? Because these new generations, they're not grown up on, on a Nazi base on the moon. They are growing up in our society, right? And they are influenced by our culture. So, uh, and when they then enter and take over this fascist structure, I, I think that some of the more peculiar things around the Nazi philosophy is an anachronism at this point, but that the essential fascism survives. What, what's your take on that? Uh, uh, yes and no. Uh, and I'll tell you why it's uh, my response is, is mixed mm -hmm. in, in for the most part. Yes, it became much more pragmatic. Um, the the Nazi old guard were still true believers in anti-Semitism and racial superiority and all the rest of this. They, they still would have their meetings at night, you know, with swastika flags and sing the old songs and dress in their old uniforms and and all the rest of it. So it, there was still this idea that. This was part of the cult. This was part of the religious uh, environment, you might say, mm. in which they were they were growing up. But at the same time, they were pragmatic. They're now in countries where they have to deal with the untermenschen. They have to deal with the, the subhumans, if you will. Yeah, and even cooperate with them and depend on them. Exactly. But they did that. But at the same time, as they were doing this, there were still ideologues abroad in the land who were trying to come up with a more uh, – defined a more uh, uh, carefully thought out ideology that would still represent their core values, but at the same time be a bit more amenable to wherever they found themselves. Mm. We have to understand that the anti-Semitism aspect of what, what you're calling the pure fascism, but in this case of the Nazi version, was still kind of important because not because of the racial aspect necessarily, but now because of a political reason. There is the state of Israel. Mm. Now, there was no state of Israel in 1945 uh, or during World War II. Uh, the exterminations were going on the camps. Israel was there, but it was part of the British protectorate, the British mandate, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But now suddenly you have the state of Israel. Yeah. And this is something that the Nazis can exploit. The, the, the hatred in the Middle East for this European, this foreign creature – in their midst called Israel, mm. uh, is something the Nazis can definitely exploit, which they did. Skorzeny uh, went to great lengths to uh, train commandos in Egypt uh, to go attacking uh, uh, Israel, you know, to, to, to training Palestinians and all the rest of it. There was this idea that, okay, Israel is a legitimate target. So there was one front in the Nazi offensive. But then the, still the most important front was communism. And 
that they didn't have to go too far to make any kind of links with uh, anti-Semitism or anything else. The Soviet Union was a nice, big, juicy target right there. And all of their um, satellites, even in Latin America, were fair game. So you had people like Klaus Barbie in Bolivia, who became the head of Bolivia's secret police for a, for a, for a long time. Mm. He's running guns. Uh, he's doing human trafficking in that area. They create something in Latin America called Operation Condor. Uh, which is involved in assassinations and terrorist activities in Europe as well as in South America and even killed uh, an ambassador, a Chilean ambassador in Washington, D.C., mm. Orlando Letelier, on orders from the Chilean government operating through a neo-Nazi network out of Colonia Dignidad, uh, the place that I visited in 79. Mm. So there, there was a, a network of political activism which was primarily directed against communism in general, Soviet style in particular, but there was an anti-Semitic aspect to it because of Israel. And the Nazis realized they had legitimacy in the eyes of certain fanatics and fundamentalists in the Middle East because of their support for uh, al-Husseini, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, who was a rabid pro-Nazi and all of this. There was something they could exploit and gain power and use the wars against Israel as kind of a testing ground for their own commando training, for weapons training and all the rest of it. So it was useful and they would get support from uh, Middle Eastern uh, potentates, you know, uh, dictators and everything else. People who idolized the Nazis because, specifically because of their anti-Semitism mm -hmm. and their anti-colonialism. Yeah. Uh, both of these things got put into one package for the Middle Eastern uh, uh, opponents of Israel. So you had uh, a useful anti-Semitism, politically motivated anti-Semitism, as opposed to a purely racial form. They had evolved to the point where, well, we're not being anti-Semitic. After all, you know, Arabs are Semites too, and et cetera, et cetera. You could make that argument. Mm. We're anti-Zionist. We're against Israel, and we're going to help you against Israel. And anyway, they're Jews and we are anti-Semites, but let's not belabor the point. You know? <laughs> yeah. So you, you, had, you, know, you had pragmatic Nazis. They were thinking in pragmatic terms. Who are our enemies? Our enemies are still communism. And Israel is now a target for us because you've basically put all the Jews in one place. Hmm. You know? So now we can use that as well because we have legitimacy. Oh, well, two places. You still have America as a Jewish state in their eyes. Yeah. Well, yes, of course. <laughs> yeah. In their eyes, yeah. But now we, but we have our credibility because we've always been against the yeah. Jews, and now we can build alliances yeah. with people in Iraq, with people in Egypt and Libya. We can build these alliances now. We have that credibility. Yeah, and as we talked about uh, last time we had you on, they, the Nazis are very much uh, to blame for the build-up of the Salafism sure. and the Wahhabism, which is, which is this yeah. most fanatical, anti-Semitical crazy fundamentalism now we have to take a break but just quickly before we take a break who do you think genuinely died among the leading nazis and who do you think based on the facts uh, hmm. survived okay aside from hitler yeah. right yeah. aside from that question well himmler i believe did die i think he did commit suicide uh when he was captured hess of course died in prison or somebody who might have been Hess, died yeah. in prison. Yeah. In which case, the real Hess was dead by that point. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, supposedly, yes. Yeah. The Hess thing is a big mystery to me still. I don't know what to make of it. Um, as we mentioned, that whole speech at the end at Nuremberg, I think was a clue to something, which is why they shut him up. Um, Bormann, I do believe... Uh, by the way, sorry to yeah. uh, abrupt yeah. you, but uh, it's interesting to notice that the, those who actually killed Hess was the very same people who created the Hitler myth of his suicide. Oh, yeah, right. We're talking about the English once again. Mm -hmm. We're talking about British intelligence. Yeah. I mean, you know, there are people who think British intelligence is virtually a satanic organization, you know. <laughs> really? Wow. Oh, yeah, well, there's... Sounds, there's, sounds yeah. like a, a separate program. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, there, there are... I mean, Lyndon LaRouche very famously started that whole thing going on years uh -huh. and years ago. Okay. Um, you know, so if you if, if you read any of Lyndon LaRouche's stuff, and a lot of it is is, you know, batshit crazy, but yeah. um, he has this fixation on British intelligence as being, you know, the hotbed of, of a, some sort of satanic cult, which is kind of close to a David Icke, you know, reptilian thing that he has going on. Yeah, yeah, we don't go there. In we don't program. go there, no, 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 no. no, no. But, but you were listing these people, and you said uh, Himmler, you, yeah, and Borman. Borman, you know, 
uh, I'm, I'm a great fan of Paul Manning and his work on yeah. Borman's Escape. Mm. Um, I really find it very fascinating that every once in a while they find another skull in Berlin that they claim is Martin Borman's. <laughs> there have been several so far. Mm. Uh, and the latest one, uh, I, I think it's very credible, the evidence that the clay they found inside the skull of Borman, uh, which was definitively proven to be Martin Borman, uh, the clay inside that skull did not come from Berlin, but it came from Paraguay. Uh, I think that's a very real, you know, piece of evidence. And when did this skull surface? This particular skull? Mm -hmm. I think this was in the 1990s, if I'm not mistaken. So it's a possibility that Borman survived all the way into the 80s then? Into the 80s, it's possible, yes. Mm. And we have seen evidence of him involved in banking. His signature has popped yep. up from the, I think it's from 1940, and all the way to, I forgot the last date, but at least the 70s, maybe even yes. later. At least into the 70s, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there's a lot of evidence that Borman escaped or somebody, you know, just like Borman. I came across in, in Hitler Legacy, which is, we're not talking about that this today, but in the address book of... Um, of uh, Hans Ulrich Rudel, um, there's a reference to a man in Paraguay who was a, a famous German Mennonite leader in a small town in Paraguay. And it happens to be the same town where it was believed that Bormann had escaped. Um, so there is, you know, s just little pieces, traces of evidence mm. that maybe the Bormann story is true, that he did escape and that he did wind up in Paraguay. Uh, the, the address book of Hans Ulrich Rudel is fascinating uh, because I've managed to identify virtually all the names, and some of them are still alive. Mm -hmm. And the, the South American aspect of it ties in neatly mm -hmm. with the idea that Borman escaped and was creating a financial uh, empire in South America. There's even post-war pictures of, uh, that alleges to be Borman. Yeah. And, and why wouldn't there if he was so... Uh, I mean, yes, he was fond of being in the shadows, but if you exist for so many years as a mover and shaker, there is bound to be some pictures. So that's Bormann. Goebbels is dead. Himmler yeah. is dead. Who else? Yeah. Mm. Who do we have left? Mengele, yeah. we know, died uh, much later than people had believed, right? Uh, Eichmann, of course, was executed. Uh, Walter Rauf lived to a ripe old age. He's the man who invented the mobile gas chamber. Mm. Uh, he's the idea came up. He's the guy who came up with the idea of gassing the Jews to death. He uh, died in Chile. Uh, I think in the 1980s, uh, he lived a, a long time. Eric Priebke escaped. Um, uh, Franz Stangl uh, escaped. A lot of, a lot of, you know, the, the important Nazis did escape. There's no question that they survived. So many Nazis went free after the war. So I guess that those who escaped were those who really had something to fear. The real heavy Nazis, the the real war yeah. criminals. Yeah. Well, some spent time in in prison. Otto Remmer, a uh, general, the man in charge of mm. uh, rooting out the conspirators in Operation Valkyrie, who was actually part of Operation Valkyrie in the beginning. Yeah. Um, he got tremendous credibility from Hitler because he went after, you know, the, the people, the Stauffenberg and everyone else mm. who was involved in that plot. He survived the war. He was uh, imprisoned briefly. Uh, he survived the war. He tried to create another Nazi organization in Austria. Uh, they slapped him for that. And then he went on, you know, speaking tours around the world, talking to Nazi groups everywhere. Um, and in talking even to American political leaders for the liberty lobby in this country, in the United States, uh, he talked to people we would consider the Tea Party today. Mm. Um, he was talking to the right wing there. He, uh, uh, I mean, it's incredible the, the number of Nazis who had places of prestige among foreign uh, political leaders in the United States, in the rest of Europe, and in Latin America, and in Asia. Mm -hmm. And Remmer is one of them, a very famous general, an unapologetic Nazi. Mm -hmm. um, and we didn't arrest him. We didn't throw him in jail. We didn't, we did nothing. We let this guy wander yeah. around raising money for Odessa. You know, it's just mm -hmm. incredible when you think about it. Yeah. Last question before the break. Yeah. Why didn't Mossad take out Hitler? Well, there's a story right there. Um, Mossad, after Eichmann, realized that this was counterproductive. Going after the Nazis was counterproductive. It was not helping the Israeli state build good relationships with other countries around the world. I ran into that brick wall myself. Um, when I went to Chile in 79, I came back. I had seen Colonia Dignidad. I had been threatened by Nazis. Mm -hmm. I had uncovered a lot of stuff during that particular trip down there, escaped with my life. 
I'm coming back and I'm talking to everybody that I can, and no one is interested. The Simon Wiesenthal people, not interested. Nobody's interested. Nobody wants to know. And in 79, I didn't realize why. I didn't know why. It wasn't until decades later that I understood the situation. Okay. Simon Wiesenthal's people, yeah. they, they hands off. Do not talk about Chile because Mossad doesn't want to talk about Chile. Israel doesn't want to talk about Chile. They want to have good relations with Chile. They want to have good relations with Argentina. Do not rock the boat. So this was a geopolitical, a realpolitik uh, uh, position that they were taking. Yes, there's Nazis there. There's a lot of Nazis there, but we're not going to do anything about it. Because, Hitler, of, because of diplomacy? Yes, because they... I, I think it sounds like there's, someone has some leverage over Israel. Well, that's also possible. I mean, it's, like it's a Bowman. much more... Well, it's a very intricate story, right? It's uh, leverage, it's diplomacy, it's economics. Yeah, that's what I think. It's corporations and economics. And Israel is one of the world's largest arms dealers as well. So, uh -huh. you you know, there's all sorts of reasons why uh, somebody at the Knesset or somebody at, in the Israeli parliament will say to themselves, uh, let's not rock the boat anymore. Even if Hitler was alive, I heard one Mossad agent said, we couldn't go after him because that would just ruin our chances of you know, developing our prestige in the rest of the world. We need, we need as many friends internationally as we can get, and that's where we stand right now. We're not going after Nazis anymore. Why are they not applying that thought pattern when it comes to dealing with the Palestinians then? I mean, they are alienating themselves on a daily basis over there. Yeah, I think... From the rest of the world, I mean. I think that's just too close to home. I yeah. think that that political issue is much more uh, immediate yeah. and going after Nazis, even though the Holocaust is a major factor in Israeli consciousness. I think they, the Palestinians are right there. You know, the Nazis, that was a long time ago. And, and let's not forget that Zionism and Nazism isn't that far apart in essence. It's very similar. Well, philosophy. they're both forms of nationalism, mm. you know, and there's, it's a, a race. Ethnically based, not nationalism. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, you could say that. I mean, it depends how you want to interpret it. I mean, you have to prove that you're a Jew to be a citizen of Israel. That's not so very different from having to prove you're an Aryan to have been part of the Nazi Germany, right? I mean, there's there's certain similarities you can look at. There's a racial thing. Israel says they're racist in that sense in reaction to the Holocaust. Since Hitler said, you guys are all Jews, you're all going to die, Israel said, fine, we're going to create a country where all the Jews can live. You know, so it was in reaction to what was happening in the world that they created their state. There's philosophy on both sides of this. And, uh, you know, I've heard both both sides try to defend themselves on this on this basis. But you do have a fear within the state of Israel that the Arab non uh, Jewish uh, populations are growing population wise at a much more aggressive rate than the, the Jewish population right, is right. within the, within the actual borders of Israel today, not counting the West Bank, not counting, you know, all the rest of it, just looking at the, the, the formal borders of Israel. So, you know, there's going to be a problem there in 20, 30 years of the Jews being a minority in their own country. Mm -hmm. So there this is pressing on their internal situation as well. So this, there's they have to make a lot of pragmatic decisions. Mm. Yeah, it makes sense. Okay, let's, uh, even though we could continue this, we need to take this break now so we can come back and go deeper. Sure. All of our files are free and will remain free. If you like the show, you can show support by donating $1 to help with expenses. Just use the PayPal link on our website, YouTube channel, or Facebook page. Thanks.